Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the eighth talk of our 2024 invited seminar series. Uh, this is organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter. And uh, today's hybrid talk uh, is also part of the IEEE CS Distinguished Visitor Program. We are delighted to host uh, a renowned researcher and Computer Society's Distinguished Lecturer, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Yuhang Liu as our guest speaker today. This talk is co-hosted by IEEE San Diego section, IEEE Vehicular Technology Society San Diego chapter, IEEE uh, Communication Society San Diego chapter, IEEE Computer Society chapters of or Orange County, San Antonio, Oregon, Central Texas, and Hawaii. So uh, we have some in-person presence and there are people online, so it's a hybrid uh, setup. Uh, the talk is co-sponsored by the IEEE CSS DPP program. As always, we have Open Research uh, Institute in cooperation as our media partner for the entire series. So I'd like to briefly introduce Professor Liu here. Uh, professor uh, Yuang Liu is an associate professor at Santa Clara University. She earned her PhD at the University of Rhode Island in 2012. Her research is focused on trustworthy computing and cybersecurity with a particular interest in emerging applications such as Internet of Things, blockchain, and online social media. Dr. Liu has published over 90 papers in prestigious journals and conferences with her work recognized as the best paper at the IEEE International Conference on Social Computing 2010 and U-Media 2016. She is the recipient of the 2019 Researcher of the Year Award at Santa Clara University School of Engineering and the 2013 University of Rhode Island Graduate School Excellence in Doctoral Research Award. Dr. Liu is a very active senior member of IEEE, serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society Technical Meeting Request Committee, IEEE Computer Society's Distinguished Visitor from 2022 to 2024, and the IEEE Computer Society Region 6 Area 4 Coordinator since 2021. That's our region or area, I think. She also holds several editorial positions in various prestigious journals. Uh, in today's talk, Dr. Liu is going to discuss about the promising applications of blockchain that can facilitate security and trust among multiple parties. So without further ado, Dr. Liu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm very glad to be uh, have the opportunity to come here and uh, give this talk. I really enjoy the weather here right now in San Jose, Santa Clara area. The weather is pretty hot. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, for today, I will uh, give a talk about our recent works uh, focusing on facilitating the security and trust among multiple parties through blockchain techniques. Um, okay. So we know that with the recent advancement in technologies, for example, 5G, 6G, 6G communication protocols, uh, AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, we have so massive amount of devices. Now they can actually get the opportunity or capability to connect online and connect with each other. So we have uh, living in a smart computing world. Um, everything is connected. For example, we have smart transportation, we have smart grid, smart agriculture, everything is smart now. <laughs> but this brings uh, a lot of opportunities. At the same time, it also um, brings us emerging challenges for security, trust, and privacy. Just to uh, talk about the high level thing from security perspective, how can we ensure that those resource limited um, things actually cannot be compromised by attackers? From per privacy perspective, how can we enable the smart decisions being made by those things without leaking users' private information? And also from the trust perspective, how can human beings believe those smart devices? And also how can those smart things actually collaborate with each other building the trust? So there are many, many challenges and we need significant efforts to work on those issues. Well, um, particularly for my research, I kind of touch upon uh, the problems and centered around trustworthy computing. Uh, I uh, extend my work uh, into energy efficient IoT security, um, secure and fair uh, digital trading based on blockchain, 
um, social uh, network security, particularly on misinformation and disinformation propagation. And recently, we also uh, joined the efforts um, developing responsible AI, uh, particularly we focus on the uh, fairness, privacy, and the trust of the um, AI technology. And then um, for today's talk, we will mainly talk about the blockchain. Um, there are many actually uh, potential um, efforts or strategies or technologies to address those issues and blockchain serve as one of the uh, promising technologies. So for today's talk, I will start talking about some basic uh, stuff about blockchain. And then I will showcase some of the recent example projects that we have done so far. So, first of all, blockchain, what is blockchain? From the name, we roughly can tell it has blocks and they chain, the blocks are chained together. <laughs> but actually, um, uh, specifically about the structure, we can see uh, there are many different transactions and they are ordered in a certain way. And uh, those uh, transactions can be organized through a cryptographic uh, tree structure so that um, the hash values of those transactions can be organized together. Then if anything um, changed about a particular transaction or the order of the transactions has been manipulated, then it will lead to the uh, higher level hash value changes so that it's easier for us to detect anything has been manipulated. But only with one block is not sufficient. Um, we have to uh, have more and more transactions. So uh, within a block, then uh, we will actually will also do a hash value for the block and the hash value of the block will be included in the next blocks block header so every anything changed in the prior block will lead to mismatch about the hash value so that later on we can actually detect anything has been manipulated and then uh, by chaining all the like blocks all the blocks together we eventually got the blockchain but with only one chain of blocks we still cannot um, prevent, for example, the malicious um, attackers from manipulating those blocks if it's only stored in a centralized server. So it requires fundamentally uh, there's a distributed network or peer-to-peer -peer network. So each of the device in the distributed network, they hold one copy of the blockchain data. So that it, for the malicious attacker, unless they can uh, take advantage or like more than 51% of the entire network, so that they can manipulate stuff. Otherwise, you know, the majority of the network, as long as they are honest, we can make sure the blocks cannot be manipulated. So that's a fundamental of blockchain, why we consider it as a you know, trustworthy storage place so that we can store information without being manipulated. Well, because it's uh, relying on a distributed network, then there are different copies. So eventually we also need to make sure all the copies, they are still consistent. Um, so we only have one consistent copy along all the machines. So that requires a certain consensus mechanism. That means all different distributed entities participating in the network, they have to achieve agreement. And that's also one of the foundation uh, for the trust establishment. So then talking about the relationship between blockchain and the trust. Blockchain require we have certain trust mechanisms so that we can make sure the copies are agreed by all the participants. On the other hand, some nice properties of blockchain also provide opportunities for us to build trust in our decentralized systems, particularly including the non-repudiation we just mentioned. If anything has been changed about uh, prior transactions that has been already recorded on blockchain, then we have technologies to detect those manipulations. And on the other hand, it's also decentralized system so that we can prevent there is a central um, powerful server or party who can actually arbitrarily manipulate the data. And on the other hand, it also offers the open validation. That means all the participating parties, they are able to get a copy of the blockchain data and they can validate if that's correct or not. And then uh, depending on who actually can participate in the blockchain network, we mark them roughly into um, you know, different categories like the public blockchain, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Anyone can actually join those blockchain networks. 
On the other hand, we may sometimes have some private information or we try to uh, limit the access to that data. So uh, permission based blockchains is another type of solution. Although still there are different parties participating, but each party has to be authenticated and giving permissions to join the network. So, uh, depending on different uh, blockchain network, then uh, we can actually assume certain trust relationship exists or not. So, that's uh, roughly the blockchain. Then, talking about different platforms, there are so many different blockchain platforms nowadays. And I will just pick up um, three very basic ones. Um, actually, blockchain started to attract people's attention from its uh, most well-known application, Bitcoin. And uh, in Bitcoin, it actually supports the simple script only. And how Bitcoin view a uh, transaction, they consider a transaction is basically something that leads to the coin's ownership exchange. So if the coin originally um, possessed by one party, then it changed the ownership, that's one transaction. But because of this narrow definition of the transaction, uh, Bitcoin is put primarily suitable for a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency exchange system. That's uh, the foundation of DeFi. And later on, with the Ethereum, it actually broadened the scope of the blockchain. Uh, it generally considered blockchain system as a state machine. So that means we have different states. Basically, uh, there could be many different accounts created on Ethereum blockchain, and each one with a public address. Then the accounts can have different states. When uh, the, uh, Ethereum basically consider a transaction as an action that will lead to the state changing from one a prior status, status to a new status. So that's how they brought in the concept. And furthermore, they also uh, uh, developed a smart contract, which basically can be considered as a soft piece of software, software stored on the uh, blockchain that can be automatically executed. So because it's open, it can be validated by any party participating in the blockchain. That way, we can avoid the smart contract being manipulated. And smart contract actually is uh, allows complex, much more complex logic, making the blockchain a Turing complete machine eventually. And because of this generalization, blockchain later on actually can be considered as a computing infrastructure, just like a computer. Well, of course, much larger scales computer. Then uh, the generalized blockchain systems can potentially um, support different applications on top of that. For example, there are some applications already being very popular, for example, the DeFi network or um, blockchain based games. Uh, NFT, those are very well known applications. Well, from the research perspective, we are also trying to utilize blockchain in different application domains. For example, for Internet of Things and for uh, Smart Grid, uh, Vehicle to Everything Network, uh, Supply Chain, Smart Health, and even more. So, um, we, um, today's limited time, I would just touch up on like one or two different application domains. So, the first one, um, using blockchain for financial services. We know that the financial uh, market is actually a very complex market. It has a lot of capital um, flowing, and there are ma many different st stakeholders, and it requires a lot of coordination, and security is also very important. So, because of the, all those uh, characteristics, we consider a permission-based blockchain is typically more suitable than a public blockchain. And also, one important feature that we need to facilitate is that we have to facilitate multiple parties' approval or endorsement process. So then uh, everybody can actually show their agreement on certain uh, things. This is how they uh, achieve the consensus. Then let's uh, take a look. So, based on different uh, platforms available, uh, Hyperledger Fabric is one permission-based blockchain that is very suitable for research because it's open source. And uh, different from Bitcoin or Ethereum, Fabric requires a strong identity management. So, it actually has the access control, and that's why it's called permission-based blockchain. And it enabled endorsement functionalities, which is suitable for financial applications. Um, one key thing is how can you show you actually agree on something in a digital way? Digital signature is one of the important solutions. 
Um, then uh, the digital signature mechanism adopted by the default version of Hyperledger Fabric is ED ECDSA, which is a classic uh, digital signature mechanism. The problem there is it's good for one party to sign up one particular message, but if we actually need to uh, collect agreement or sign messages from multiple parties, then uh, using the default version will have a problem. First of all, it's inefficient. We need to collect the signature from each individual endorser. Uh, that can be time consuming. Also, the verification and the storage of the digital signatures will be uh, uh, very uh, resource consuming. For example, each signature, well, if we have 10 parties, then the overall length of the aggregated signature will be 10 times of the original one single signature. And also we have to verify each individual signature one by one. That's also very time consuming. Uh, last but not least, it's lack of scalability. So we need some other solutions. And one promising solution is a multi-signature mechanism. So just like uh, in this diagram, when multiple parties need to agree on one message, each party can actually host its own private key and sign the message. And at the end, all the signatures will be aggregated as a multi-signature. The lens of the multi-signature is just the same lens of one single signature. And the verification, you just verify that aggregated signature and you are done. You don't have to verify it multiple times. So that gives us a lot of, you know, um, res uh, uh, a lot of benefits for saving the storage space for making the verification more uh, efficient. So that's a very promising solution. And we actually built a couple of works on this multi-signature mechanism design. And um, now I just uh, gave a brief, uh, I just choose one of the project and give an example. So um, let's talk about the existing multi-signature basis. Uh, digital signatures, there are different versions. For example, RSA-based signature, SNOR-based signature, and the BLS-based digital signature. Each one of them has its own pros and cons. For RSA-based signature, it has much longer signature lens. For example, here you can see it's uh, uh, 2048 bits. Um, the benefit is that it, uh, it is based on multiplications, so it's more computationally friendly. On the other extreme end is the BLS-based signature. Um, from the signature lens perspective, it, it creates the shortest signature, which is only 224 bytes, uh, bits, which is much shorter. So that's good for storage. However, this signature is based on bilinear pairing, which is very time consuming. Um, so because of that, because of that, we uh, there's a, something in the middle called snore-based signature. Um, the signature length is not too big, uh, like uh, it's 448 bits, double the size of the BLS-based signature, but it's based on multiplications. So that means it's also um, uh, more efficient. So because of that, it's uh, like a, a, a better solution we consider. And so some of our multi-signature schemes are based on snore signature. And here you can see we did a very brief uh, comparison about the multiplication time cons consumption and the bilinear uh, pairing time consumption. You can see it's much higher than the mul multiplication operations. And then choosing the second category, there are also different multi-signature uh, specific uh, sp schemes proposed. One of the most popular one is called COC. The most, uh, well, it actually provides a very nice um, feature that is the scalability. Let's briefly take a look of uh, what this COC signature look like. So uh, the major advantage of that is it actually constructs all the different endorsers, uh, the signers in a spanning tree. That is a, a, a loop-free logical topology. So that means there's only one path, single path, between any two network nodes. And because of this way of organizing different signers, uh, it can support high scalability. And that's the benefit, uh, it's scalable. But uh, there is always a root node in this, um, in this tree, right? And the root node, which is called the leader node, typically needs to do more computation. And this node is typically 
uh, more um, powerful. And because of that, there are actually two potential uh, attacks. One is called row key attack. That this attack actually can be launched by any signers, any node in this tree. They claim they have a specific public uh, public key, but actually that's not their public key. So that's what we call by row key. By uh, misclaiming their public key, they can manipulate the uh, aggregated multi-signature. That's the uh, first attack. The second attack is called KSUM problem attack. Basically, without talking about the mathematical details, basically, if there is a very powerful leader node who actually will uh, coordinate the signature process, then uh, this leader node with sufficient computation capability will be able to um, calculate, uh, uh, how to say it, by solving a KSUM problem, will be able to manipulate the aggregated signature. So those are the two types of attacks that uh, this COSI uh, signature is facing. Then uh, in this work, our major goal is, or our major contribution is that we propose a new uh, multi-signature scheme called uh, gamma-based multi-signature scheme. It adopts spanning tree structure from the COSI uh, multi-signature scheme so that it supports high scalability. But at the same time, it also addressed the two attack issues. By requiring a proof of possession, we are able to um, make the signature process um, robust against the row key attack. And also, we improved the signing process so that the, even the, uh, there is a powerful leader node, uh, leader node, malicious leader node, we still can prevent that leader node from manipulating the signature. So that's a major contribution. But only with that uh, is not sufficient. We also further improved the signing process to make it more um, time efficient. So that's a major contribution of this work. Then let's talk about the first one. Um, uh, by um, designing the um, proof of possession, we were able to make the scheme um, robust against the row key attack. And this is a mathematical dis, uh, explanation about how the mechanism works. Without talking about the detail, let's see. Regular um, uh, public key and secret key is that your, there is a certain relationship between the public key and the, the secret key. But uh, in the regular multi, in the regular multi-signature scheme, um, the node, the signers could actually claim it has a particular public key without own the um, secret key, corresponding secret key. But by having adding an additional proof of possession, like the pi here, which is calculated based on the secret key and the original uh, public key, we attach that to the original public key to make it a um, new public key and announce that. In this case, uh, any third parties can validate this equation and check if the uh, specific signer actually own the specific public key it claims or not. So that whole process is called proof of possession. With this being in place, we can make sure everyone can only claim it has a certain public key um, when it actually don't really own that key. Then that's one uh, uh, solution. Well, on the other hand, we also need to further improve the signing process so we can actually make the uh, signature signing process against the uh, KSUM attack. So let's look at the signing process. We have this spending tree structure in place. So then we actually separate the signing process into four different phases. Phase number one, there is a message received by all the signers and the leader node needs to um, populate that message to all the nodes. And basically each parent just need to distribute the message to its children nodes and uh, following that way. So it's top down approach that's marked in blue. And after receiving the message, all the nodes will provide their commitment saying that I will be participating in the signing process. That's a bottom up um, uh, direction. Then the leader node will launch the signing process. It um, generates the challenge and then pass it down to all the nodes and each node will ag aggregate the, uh, the challenge together with the hash value of the received message and provide their signature um, all the way up. And eventually the leader node will be able to aggregate the overall signature. So that's a process, um, two runs back and forth. Then um, 
actually the Oriental C uh, signature, um, they actually create the challenge based on the message. So that way, the leader node with compute, uh, high computational power will be able to uh, manipulate, um, replace the original message by another uh, constructed message and uh, manipulating the uh, aggregated signature. But now the solution, our solution is we separate the message from the challenge. So in order to manipulate the aggregated signature, the leader node needs to be able to manipulate both challenge and uh, um, the mass, uh, original message, which is more difficult. So that's how we make the uh, signing process strong, uh, like more robust against that case of attack. And later on, you can actually take a look for, um, we actually can make this, um, these uh, four phases like online and offline. What do we mean by online? Online means we have to receive the message and the later processing relies on the message it itself. The offline processing means without the message, we can actually pre-compute certain uh, values. So if we separate the, uh, the four phases into online and offline, you can see phase two and three, uh, they don't rely on the message itself. So they are actually, they can be done offline. Then if we can do phase two and phase three before the message actually come, so we can get all the centers ready. Then we can actually improve the online processing time. So we can make the pro um, signature process or the sending process more efficient. So that's the idea behind. Based on that, we actually change the orders of those four phases. So the highlighted two phases, phase two and phase three, we decide to move them on top and they can be done without receiving the message at all. So then once the message come, we will only need to do phase, uh, phase three and four. That way we can actually improve the time. So that's the um, proposed scheme, high level overview. Then we actually did, uh, did a test on the um, uh, running time. So um, you can see this result. We compare our proposed scheme, which is marked in blue versus the original COSI uh, signature scheme. You can see um, our online uh, running time on the leader node is much lower than the comparison scheme. Then we also need to apply the proposed scheme on the um, fabric on the real blockchain. So what we have changed is the uh, uh, sending process. So there is a client who needs to send or submit a message for endor endorsement. And on top, you can see that's the um, endorsers or the signers. They're organized in a spanning tree structure. And what we did is we first uh, do the offline computation and get ready. So we send a message to the client. When client receive that, they can send the message to be signed to the endorsers. And then we um, actually follow the proposed signing process to sign, provide the signature, and then we can uh, send the send the message back to the client. Then the client can submit it to the blockchain and all the later process will follow the regular fabric blockchain um, transaction process. So that's what we have changed on the blo blockchain. And then we also did a performance test. So you can see that um, we actually have, a, we have done a comparison by comparing the uh, total transaction time uh, and also the uh, online transaction time. So you can see the orange one is our proposed scheme with only online computational time considered. And the uh, yellow one is the total time of the proposed scheme. And the blue one was the default signature um, running time. So you can see with the yellow, even with the yellow one, we are slightly smaller um, than the original signature scheme. And with the orange one, that means if we only consider online computational time, we are much better. So that's the uh, first work. Then um, other than the multi-signature scheme, we also try to apply blockchain in different application domains, trying to uh, uh, facilitate um, fair trading process. And one of the uh, particular application domain is the um, smart grid domain or uh, energy domain. We know that uh, we are facing the climate change, the weather. We are ex uh, experiencing extreme weather more and more frequently in recent years. We have, especially in California, the wildfire <laughs> more frequently. And there's also drought or, you know, um, hurricanes all over the world. And uh, there's a global effort trying to address the climate change issues. And of course, there are different 
uh, disciplines they can actually contribute. Uh, from IEEE perspective, last year's uh, president, uh, he actually is um, with his uh, technical expertise fall into clean energy and sustainability. I think he actually tried to uh, promote the sustainability within IEEE and beyond. Um, then we, from uh, our uh, research perspective, we mainly focus on the smart grid perspective, trying to um, um, involve more distributed clean energy resources and to support uh, everyone's electricity need. So that's uh, what our efforts fall into. And you can see recently there's a very uh, rapid development about the distributed energy resources. That means with each individual houses, with universities, with uh, even like commercial buildings, those, you know, uh, originally uh, electricity consumers, we are now becoming more capable of even generating energy by equipped with, for example, solar panels, uh, battery, EVs, all those are considered as distributed energy resources now. So with the generation capability, now we may not, not only be satisfied like generating the energy for our own purpose, we may want to generate excessive energy if we are able to, and then potentially we can support each other Right, so we can actually facilitate the exchange or even like a free market <laughs> among the consumer side. So we now no longer just call us the consumer, we call us the prosumer. That means energy producer and consumer. <laughs> and in order to further facilitate people actually adopt more distributed energy resources, um, there if we, we consider if there's um, um, financial motivations that will facilitate the process. And if we are able to enable a fair um, trading market established at the edge of the smart grid, and then we are able to facilitate people providing um, financial incentives for people to adopt more uh, generation capability. So uh, based on that, we actually develop a, a series of work. This is one example. Um, Actually, using blockchain to facilitate decentralized energy trading is no longer just a very new concept. There are some existing works already, but most of the existing works, they only consider the blockchain layer. How can uh, different parties participating in the blockchain facilitated transaction? They seldom consider or combine the blockchain layer versus the um, underneath power line layer. Uh, because of, you know, the expertise requires are quite different. It requires multidisciplinary collaborations. And what we did is we collaborating with, um, you know, uh, researchers in the power line, a uh, power domain, and we actually connect the simulation between the blockchain and the underneath power, um, power grade. So um, that's a major um, contribution from this work. And also, we develop different smart contracts to facilitate the trading process. And um, we were able to build an integrated, also open source, co-simulation platform for energy trading and management, particularly for those uh, energy consumers. Um, also, we develop a blockchain-based energy market, which supports uh, decentralized, transparent, and fair trading. Um, and it's also relying on the Hyperledger fabric. Uh, we develop different smart contracts to facilitate the overall process. And this is an overview of the um, simulation platform we have developed. It's built based on the uh, TESP platform, um, you know, developed by originally by the uh, PNNL, the National Lab. And uh, on top of that, we actually, uh, our major uh, revision or major contribution focus on the blue, sorry, the green box here where we uh, built the um, uh, energy management and the trading process for the uh, consumers. And particularly uh, in this work or in this talk, I want to talk about the blockchain uh, part that we have built. Our proposed scheme, uh, we actually consider there could be different consumers. They may have different um, uh, where they may be equipped with different uh, energy resources. For example, they may be equipped with smart appliance like uh, HVAC system so that they can dynamically um, 
adjust the energy consumption. Right now, the energy price, the electricity price is so high. So maybe I could, uh, you know, um, adjust my temperature to be slightly higher, and then I can save energy and also save money. But later on, if the energy price goes down, maybe I can, you know, turn on my air conditioner more, and so that I can consume the energy. I may, for example, also have the uh, smart dishwashers. That can only or that also uh, that only operate during the uh, non peak hours, so I can save my um, energy. Or I may have my EVs, and my EV could potentially you know draw um, energy from my house. But when I'm needing like energy and the energy price is so high, maybe if I my EV can actually support discharging so that it can can serve as a battery uh, to power up my house. So those are different solutions uh, being discussed. And um, those are overall considered as smart uh, houses that can actually facilitate the power generation and the consumption. So then uh, what we did is we actually proposed three different uh, smart contracts, which facilitate the uh, double auction process. That is uh, something borrowed from the stock market. And it supports multiple different parties serving as buyer and seller to actually provide their bid. And based on the bid, the market will make a clear market clearing price based on the bidding price and the quantity. And that's uh, one of the smart contract we have um, finished. And also we can uh, facilitate the energy exchange uh, by actually checking if the uh, bidding result has been followed or not. If there is a malicious seller who actually claim I have this amount of energy I want to sell, and um, you know, participating the, uh, in the bidding process, and did not provide the committed energy amount to the uh, to a particular buyer, then we actually can uh, by monitoring the uh, smart meters, reading the smart meter data, we will actually recognize yes, this um, transaction was not followed. Then we can actually punish the malicious seller. So that's one of the advantage we can do. That is uh, to close the loop. And also, because everything is built, built on uh, fabric, uh, they do not actually have the uh, uh, digital currency they do not support. So eventually, what we want to also convert the um, tokens into the digital currency so that we actually connect the uh, fabric with Ethereum so that we can allow the users to actually gain real money from the uh, energy transactions. So that's the different smart contract we have finished. So that's the um, three smart contracts we support. And now we also run some uh, simulation. So um, this is the bidding process. You can see we have the sellers. Uh, we rank the sellers from top to uh, bottom. And we uh, actually also rank the buyers based on their bidding price from um, high to low so that we can find a, you know crossing points. So that means all the sellers and the uh, buyers, they um, on the left hand side of this crossing point, they can uh, they can basically have a uh, win the uh, bidding, have a successful bidding. So then they need to follow the bidding results to provide the energy or provide the money, and we can use smart contract to ensure everyone is honest. And uh, last but not least, we also try, uh, you know, the asset uh, exchange and we uh, compare our work with a state of the art work. So, uh, in this simulation, we run uh, 30 different houses and we showcase just some of the transaction process. So, that's the energy domain. And the uh, summary is that we actually built a blockchain facilitated energy trading and management co simulation platform in this work. And based on that co simulation platform, we uh, uh, developed smart contracts to facilitate fire, uh, fair and uh, trustworthy energy transactions among different parties. And we can keep track of those malicious behaviors and make sure it's pan uh, penalized. So that's how we facilitate the energy transaction. Okay, with that being said, um, I can conclude my uh, talk for now. And uh, talking about the future directions, we do believe the blockchain technology provide us a promising solution to facilitate trustworthy computation for different application domains. And 
uh, for example, smart cities, transactive energy market, autonomous vehicle networks, even we have some of the work on those uh, on those domains. And uh, we believe hopefully with the um, trustworthy technologies, we're able to build a fair and uh, transparent future for smart computing. That's all. Thank you. And uh, this is my contact information. I'm open to any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so any question from the audience? So it would be something a bit different than what's currently being done at some centralized uh, power provider, just giving a price. Yeah. Purchasing mm -hmm. uh, energy that you produce at a fixed price. So this enables each individual to choose uh, choose the best deal that they can get, right? Yes, actually, uh, right now, uh, this is research, which is a little far from reality right now. In reality, we have the utility companies. They are actually making a different pricing structure, providing that. Uh, and then, uh, for example, uh, one of the straightforward solution is a fixed rate, no matter when you use how much energy is the same price. Or they may also have time of use based on the peak hour or the regular hour, uh, off peak hour, let's say. For the peak hour, they may charge you much higher, and for the regular hour, they charge you lower. So it's more like a centralized, um, you know, uh, pricing structure. But uh, when we look for, uh, forward, um, relying only on utility companies, uh, actually, uh, it's um, they are trying to make it fair, and they are trying all the different efforts, uh, making it better and better. But again, um, from the end user perspective, that does not provide sufficient incentives to adopt new technologies like solar panel, like EV, like battery. Uh, taking battery as example, because that's kind of purely used for energy, right? Um, it's very expensive. And through our some empirical studies, we found that uh, you, even if you have battery, you think you have more flexibility to, you know, use your um, um, electricity in a much flexible way. For example, like when I need to do EV charging, we undo some. But overall, based on the current pricing structure, all you can save is very limited compared with, you know, the, yeah, front, um, uh, uh, just the price you have to pay in front, right? That's uh, like you may expect about over 10 years period for payback. So individual users like, like us, like regular users, we may not have the incentive to do, adopt it, right? So in order to provide more incentives, we do think the market should be more open so that more stakeholders can partic uh, participate in the market. It may not be individual houses at this moment, but there could be some virtual power plant. So those are like aggregators they actually can uh, work with multiple or uh, like a small community and um, on behalf of them to participate the market. Yeah, so it requires, you know, certain steps to take on. And also it's related with the public policy, the regulation about the energy market is kind of sensitive market. Yeah. yeah. Uh, recently, um, based on the prior work, we actually got an NSF award uh, for developing these um, uh, global centers. It actually supports like global interactions or uh, like collaborations. We collaborate with uh, Concordia University from Canada, and we are now also uh, establishing collaborations with a uh, Ibero University from Mexico uh, to actually facilitate this DR market. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, sorry. Um, so could you speak a little bit more about the open source platform? Is there is it on GitHub or? Yes, it's on GitHub. Uh, I think did I? I think I pre. Oh yeah, I I provide a link here. Yeah, later I may share the slides so you can take a look. research area mentioned vehicle to everything network. Right. Can you give an example of a criteria that in your study? Yeah. 
So um, actually, there could be many different problems to study. Uh, one of the problem is, again, in the vehicle um, network, the vehicles are becoming also smarter. <laughs> they can talk to each other and share information. Um, so, some of the potential topics could be, for example, uh, when vehicles are driving on the road, they may communicate with each other, sharing the road condition. Or um, another example could be the parking lot, right? You may have vehicles telling you uh, in the particular parking lot, there are still some spots available. And that those vehicles, they can lie. <laughs> they don't have to tell you the truth all the time, right? So, there's always trust, trust issues there involved. And uh, another example could be the vehicles. Um, I think they are equipped with a lot of sensors already. Um, we know like uh, in the US, um, some of our transportation infrastructure is already kind of old and um, need a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rebuild or renovation. But with those sensors uh, equipped on those, you know, uh, intelligent vehicles, they already sense the environment around maybe just directly using those vehicles as those moving sensors. They are driving along the city. Why not utilizing or provide them some incentives for them to send back the information they have collected? <laughs> yes, uh, security. And also, if, they, uh, if you want to utilize those vehicles as the moving sensors to collect data about the road condition, about what's going on, then you may need to provide some incentives for them to participate, right? And blockchain can also serve as a platform for that purpose. Yeah. We didn't address all of them, but those are some examples. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you think this is more technical or is there legislation, regulation, the utilities are against that? There are many challenges. <laughs> some are technical, some are not. Like, like you mentioned, um, the regulations, for example. Uh, for example, in the energy domain, it's highly regulated. Um, even in California, we are like a deregulated. But uh, again, uh, for example, uh, right now, uh, according to the public policy, we still do not allow or individual houses. You can equip with those uh, DRs. You can generate energy, but you are not allowed to um, to actually trade them. Uh, so how can we enable uh, the energy be flowed among different uh, individual houses? That's still a challenge from policy perspective. Um, and there are many different efforts. For example, it's not only computing technology. It's also uh, the power line uh, strategy. And uh, we also need some uh, uh, like uh, uh, economic models. How can we actually establish a, a vi viable economic model to allow people to participate and gain uh, benefits, economic benefits? So there are many different aspects. Uh, from technology perspective or from computing technology perspective, I think right now, as a computer scientist, we need to talk to also the um, people working in the power grid. Uh, understand how power works. Um, like when we study a uh, blockchain, especially for people working on blockchain, we understand everything as a digital digital bits or bytes. But uh, the power line is different. <laughs> like um, uh, the power flows, right? It may not be easy to be kind of digital digitalized. And how do you monitor, for example, uh, like transaction wise? You can say, oh, I provide this amount of digital currency, so you charge me. But how can you ensure the energy that the seller provided actually also match with the uh, committed amount? Like you need certain uh, meters to actually support uh, your, um, you know, checking the verification. But how do you connect the power line with blockchain with the cyber system? Uh, like from power people perspective, they think our uh, technology may give them a lot of burden. <laughs> so they may not be willing to adopt some of the technologies we propose. So we have to talk to uh, understand uh, different disciplines. So that's, yeah, that's another challenge. Yes. Wouldn't it be uh, like beneficial though, because then like the power grid would be able to stabilize better and then blockchain would be able to like create that trust not like the vehicle to everything thing would like 
create that like stability of the power grid? Like, would that be the ultimate goal? Yes, that's what we uh, we think. Well, in the ideal world, that's what's gonna happen. <laughs> but we need to persuade others. And also, there's like it's not like a rosy way. Uh, there are challenges where uh, reality there are some real world problems. Yeah, we have to handle. And also, why uh, it requires like even global inter uh, collaborations because uh, in the U.S. we have the energy, uh, you know, or smart grid working like this way, but uh, in um, mm, Mexico, for example, it could be uh, completely different. Uh, they have much higher uh, regulated market. It's a state who actually owns the grid. Um, and for some of the remote communities, there's no um, power distribution line established yet. So how can you support those uh, communities? Uh, what would be a better, more economic solution for them? Uh, that's a challenge. And for um, we often compare, for example, we are located in California. We have a more open market, but my collaborator, they are located in uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec, um, Canada. So uh, their market is more uh, also highly regulated, but their energy price or the uh, electricity price is much lower than what we have here. <laughs> and their weather is different. So we can ad uh, adopt solar panel in San uh, California because we have so much sunshine, but in uh, Montreal, uh, Canada, <laughs> they have half a year, more than half a year with big snow. So, um, you know, solar may not be a, a best solution for them, but they have a high, a hydro uh, power. So that can be a renewable or, um, uh, clean energy for them. So there are different uh, situations also related with the geographic location. Yeah. Like the value of my EV, how? And then this will like kind of like store. Yes. Our battery. So like could something like that be Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So for talking about EVs, um, originally or most of in reality, they are still just the one direction charging, but people are already studying how can we make it bidirectional. So just as we mentioned, uh, the EVs, uh, when, you're re uh, when you need energy, they can actually serve as a battery. So that's some of the technologies uh, are developed in that direction. Also, um, uh, people are talking about like, if you just uh, purely purchase a battery for individual house, it's very expensive. But how about uh, for EVs, they use battery, but they have a high requirement about the uh, battery. When they no longer need the battery, those battery may just be, you know, 80% of their, uh, they still have 80% of their capacity. Maybe that can be retired and then used for individual houses. So there are different solutions uh, there as well. Yeah. And um, there's a, a lot of uh, research recently also trying to apply blockchain for EV, EV charging and um, provide incentives there. Yes, no problem. Uh, just as a complimentary comment to your discussion, by the way, I'm from power industry. So oh, great. Yeah. It's already happening in the, in the physics, you know, that the energy we are generating excessive than the demand. It is already injecting, being injected to the grid and someone in the neighborhood is using that. So this transaction is already happening between the houses and the grid, but not from the financial point of view. And this blockchain technology is trying to solve that aspect, but but I believe the utilities are totally against this <laughs> because because it is reducing their you know, energy cells. Yes. And this is a big big issue. Right, and also for uh, from utility perspective, they want um, the grid to be stable, stabilized. That's very important. So uh, for individual, the energy is generated by individual houses. It, the quality and the stability may be an issue. So sometimes um, they'd rather you don't actually send the energy back. <laughs> you better use up what you have generated. So yeah, so there's a different perspective. How is pricing gonna work? Like if I set my price, my neighbor say. Yeah, so. Right, right. So <laughs> it's complex. That's why some of the um, business perspective, the economics uh, studies, uh, they are actually building different models. So um, double auction is one of the most popular model um, built for the uh, energy market. 
um, that means, um, you know, there are two basically two different types of uh, participants. One uh, from the seller perspective, the other from the buyer perspective. And um, what they do is typically they will just um, offer a price, and the sellers will be ranked um, from top down based on uh, their offering price, the selling price from low to high, like that way. And the buyer side will be ranked according to their um, uh, the, the price they want to pay for from high to low, that way. And then there will be a line drawn there so that uh, everyone above the line, they kind of agree on something like a minimum price, and then that uh, can be matched. And what we did here is, um, this may be a little other ones that I avoid that concept because um, that's not really related directly to uh, blockchain. But um, there's also recently, I think uh, five or six years ago, uh, uh, per, some per, uh, two, one or two professors from the uh, University of Vermont, they bring up this new concept called packetized energy. So rather than treating uh, energy or uh, uh, electricity as a flow, uh, continuous data, they're actually trying to uh, mimic the uh, internet, the packet, packet switched internet. <laughs> so they actually digitalize the power. And then uh, they can consider, you know, um, you may add uh, additional separate or digital information into the power flow. So like a high frequency signals, etc. So that can carry certain information. For example, the sender, yeah, the source and destination of the power packet. So we actually built some work on top of that concept. And then, uh, yeah, we were able to digitalize the packets. Then we can actually uh, very accurately uh, measure like how much, how many packets were being transacted. <laughs> and we associate that with our blockchain implementation. So that's his work. And um, they also get, uh, I think uh, their startup company got acquired by, I forgot, California, some, uh, you know, I, I forgot if that's pg &E or some other, <laughs> which is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we can continue in the lobby. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating in the hub. <laughs> Thank you. And feel free to contact me offline. Um, here's my contact information, my email. 